What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, I wanted to work out one of these qualitative, quantitative translation problems or the QQTs that you're going to see on the part two free response of the AP exam. And the things I want to do, because of course, you can look up the scoring guide, but I want to go through some like specific things and some notes that you should take with you to understand exactly what's going on and breaking through each thing. So first off, this is going to be 12 points. In 2020, it's going to be a little different, but this time domain, okay, it's very, very important that we know the content so that we can work through it. 25 minutes is going to be essentially what you need with not a lot of give and take there, okay? So please, always be conscious of the time when you're practicing these problems. Don't sit down for two hours and work them out this by this. Give yourself a 25-minute block and see how well you're doing, Okay. So let's read this question real quick. This problem explores how masses and blocks of acceleration. So this is essentially going to be a kinematics problem with a little bit of dynamics in there as well. Um, it has negligible friction. All right. Now that does not mean no friction. It just means there's a small amount and there's a uh, block A, obviously, block B, and it hangs from this pulley with a light string. Okay, that's fine. The pulley has a negligible mass, which is awesome because that means that it's not going to have a moment of inertia. And also, it'll have negligible friction. So it won't take any energy away from the system, so energy can be conserved. And this released from rest, that's going to be very important to us as well because we're going to know that the velocities of both of these blocks are going to start with no velocity. So for part A, sub I, it says suppose the masses of block A is much greater. Okay, so this one is going to be big. Estimate the magnitude of the acceleration of the blocks after release. When they say magnitude, they want an amount. If we remember, we labeled things as variables, and that variable equal to magnitude, any unit. So this magnitude is the number piece, and it's very, very important for us on this particular part to relate to some number. Now, we're not going to solve for a number specifically, but we must reference a number, okay? I've seen in the past students for this question, they want to write, well, the blocks are going to accelerate at the same rate. That is true, but we need to come up with a magnitude here. So essentially, this is going to have a massive amount of mass, a huge and this little block is going to have just a little bit. Now, there's still going to be a net force on this block this way. So there is still going to be an acceleration that's greater than zero meters per second squared. All right. It's not going to be zero. There'll still be some because of this negligible friction. But because this is so big, the acceleration is going to be close to zero. It's going to be very, very small. So the answer that they're looking for in this particular part is they want like negligible or they want close to zero or they want less than G by a lot. Here's where I'm referencing a number. I'm close to zero. I'm less than G. When they ask for a magnitude, make sure you reference some sort of known amount. Even this negligible here, you'd have to have a pretty good description, which is the second part of this, describing why you chose that answer, to get away with negligible. The really the things they wanted was close to zero, very, very close to zero, or very far away from G, less than G, things like that. And like I said, that explanation here is going to be because block A has such a much larger mass, block B, although it's going to be able to pull it because of the net force, it's not going to be able to pull it by very much. Okay, so now here's part two of this. Now they want to change it and make it a lot less than block B. And once again, they want to know the magnitude. So you must reference some sort of number. So this is going to be huge. Huge. It's huge. And this is going to be very small. Almost nothing. Now, if you think, if it was in fact nothing, what would this block do? It would just be in free fall. If this block wasn't here, the string would have no tension in it, and this block would just fall to the ground. So that's going to make this so small, like 0 0.00000001 kilograms, okay? When that's the case, B will fall and accelerate close to G. So there's the number that I referenced. This is a constant. Even better... But the actual value for G, or as we use in the AP, to get the point for this, you must say one of these three phrases and you must reference G in some way, shape, or form. Now, I've seen students say that it's going to accelerate faster than G. Students, you cannot accelerate faster than your F net can apply. 
right? And the only force that's acting on the system, now granted, you can accelerate if I threw it down, but I didn't throw it down, I released it. So the only force that's acting here is FG, right? So that's as fast as I can possibly accelerate, which is the acceleration due to gravity, which are these two values, All right? So in no way, shape, or form can block B accelerate faster than G. And for your explanation here, I would just say that B wants to accelerate at G, but it can't because of block A. So the smaller the mass of A, the closer I can get to, quote, A not being there, and therefore, the closer I can get to G. So my answer would be B wants to accelerate at G, 9.8 meters per second squared, but it can't because A has a mass and it slows it down. But the smaller A is, the less it is there, and the closer that B can now get to G. Okay, now it says, now suppose neither block's mass has much greater than the other, but they are not necessarily equal. So they have similar mass. The dots represent A and B as indicated in the labels. On each dot, draw and label the forces, not the components, exerted on the block after its release. Represent each force with a distinct arrow starting on and pointing away from the dot. So when I was looking through some of my students, this starting on the arrow is very, very important, okay? Let me give you an example of what I mean. If they give you this dot and you draw your forces like this, they're not gonna give you credit. These arrows must start on the dots, okay? And also, guys, too, don't be sloppy about this, please. Like, don't be making your arrows like all over the place like this. Make them right like this is the AP exam and like you have a little bit of pride in your work, okay? So those are two very important things when I was grading my students, some things that I saw. Next, let's look at the forces that are acting on this. I drew like a very simple diagram so we can see. Block B has the force due to gravity that acts on it. So we have the force due to gravity on block B. And then this string is going to supply some force of tension. So on block B, I'm gonna write straight down the force of gravity, and the force of tension. Now on this block over here, I have this has a force due to gravity, right? It has a mass, so gravity is going to act on it. And the table is going to say, hey, you're not going to fall to the ground. I'm going to keep you up, which is the force of the normal. And then the string over here is going to say, hey, I want to pull you this way with some applied force. And we call that the force of tension. So when we say block A, block A has a force due to gravity, it has a force due to tension, and it has a force due to the normal. Now granted, although the force of the normal and the force of gravity are not in the direction of motion, they're still there, all right? So they're not in the direction of motion, but they still exist. So the points for this one, they gave one point if you put the force of gravity on both blocks, they gave you one point if you wrote the force of tension on both blocks, and they gave you one point if you wrote the force of the normal. So this was a three-part diagram. Also, like I said, these arrows must start at the dot, and they must be at 90 degrees from one another, and they must be straight up and down to the best of your ability, okay? If you had, say, FG and FN all over the place, like you were just like, yeah, this is FN, and you were being all sloppy like some of you like to do, like, they're not going to give you credit for that. So that was a very simple diagram here. The only real thing I saw was students forgetting to put this and this, and I assume it's because it wasn't in the direction of motion, so they didn't put it, but that does still exist. All right, so in this question, they want to derive an acceleration of the blocks after they release in terms of MA, MB, and physical constant as appropriate, okay? The thing that I saw was some kids, instead of writing G, they wrote like 10 meters per second squared. Guys, if they don't want numbers in there, you have to solve for just variables, okay? If you need to draw anything other than what you need in part B, blah, 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 use it below. Do not add anything to the figure in part B. Okay, so here's essentially what they're looking at. You must show every step of your thought process. You guys need to remember, and I saw this when I was grading, you guys need to remember that the person grading this exam does not know you like I might know you. They can't assume that you know things. They can't just be like, oh, Susan, she always does that. Like, that is not the case. Or, oh, Tammy's really bright, so I know that she really knew that. She just forgot to add that step. You must show every step of the way. So the first point was given for you setting up the net force on both objects in the direction of motion. So, for example, the F net on this block 
was equal to FT in the direction of motion. For this block, it was FG and FT. So F net equaled FG minus FT. Okay, and the reason that that was minus is because I called the direction of motion, the DOM is this way, which is positive, and then it came around the pulley and it went this way, which is positive. So anything in the DOM must be positive. I call this positive because with the DOM, I call this positive because with the DOM, this FT goes against the DOM, so it is minus. You needed to put these expressions for both blocks to get one point. You then needed to say that the acceleration is equal to the F net of the system in the direction of motion minus M total. So if we plug in the F net from here and the F net from there, I'll change the colors so we can see. I'll make everything from this F net blue. So we say FT, now this force I'll make in green, plus FG minus FT is divided by the mass of block A plus the mass of block B. So that's M total. Now some beautiful things here. These will cancel out. And we know that FG can be written as MG of block B. So the final answer that they wanted was A equals M of B times G divided by MA plus MB. This was worth one point. These were worth one point. And then bringing these two together was worth one point. And guys, I, my students, you need to get this right because I always said, Rule number one of a system with pulleys is find the acceleration of a system. We've been, that was the first thing we did. So please, please make sure you get this one right. Now this question is beautiful. Consider the scenario of AII, uh, where we're doing, saying that block A was much less than block B. Does your equation for the acceleration in part C agree with this? So essentially, if we take what we just wrote, and we make the mass of this very, very small, 0 0.0000001 kilograms. Okay, if that is close to zero, we can now say, all right, if this is close to zero, let's say with significant figures, we now write this as AMBG divided by, we'll call it a zero plus MB. Well, what would happen then to the MBs? They'd go away. And we would see that A would be G divided by this very, very small thing, or A would be close to G. So does this acceleration agree? It sure does, yes. And there's your explanation right here. In this last one, what they wanna do is they wanna add mass to the pulley. All right, when they add mass to the pulley, they're gonna call this T2. And when it had no mass, it was T1. All right, and they want us to relate T1 and T2 and which one's greater. Now intuitively, I know that if I have the block on the table like this, I know that in scenario one, this tension just needs to pull on block A. But in, t in situation two, now B has to pull on A and turn the block as well. So I think there's going to be you know, less acceleration. The system's going to move slower, which is going to make T2 greater than T1. But now let's prove it to ourselves just to make sure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the T1 scenario and I'm going to set up the T2 scenario. And essentially my goal is to come up with expressions for each one of these and then be able to compare. So we know that A equals F net over M total. And earlier we found out that the acceleration of this system is really just FG of block B over MA plus MB. Now over here in scenario two, the same is going to hold true, but now the acceleration is going to be equal to FG of block B because there's no difference in net force, right? The pulley's not adding force, it's adding mass. So now we have the mass A plus mass B plus the mass of the pulley. So with more mass, as mass goes up, what happens to A? It goes down. So we know now that A1 is going to be greater than A2. And this is the relationship that we're going to build later, right? First thing you do in a situation with pulleys is you find the acceleration of the system. Now I can go and I can make my system smaller to just block B. So I have FG, which is really just equal to MB times little g. And then I am going to have the force of tension in scenario one. And I can do the same thing over here where I still have FG and we see that that's still MB little g. But now we have force of tension 2. 
and we have to prove that when A2 is less than A1, FT goes up. All right, so let's set up our situations here. For scenario one, we know that A1 is going to be equal to F net over M. And I'm just going to look at this little system here. So I know that A1 is equal to FG minus FT1 divided by the mass of block B. So if I clean this up a little bit, I'm going to multiply both sides by MB. I'm going to make this MB times G. And we see that MB times A1 equals MBG, here's FG, minus FT1. If I add FT1 over here and subtract this over here, I have an expression for FT1, which equals MBG minus MB. A1. So I'm going to factor out an MB because those are equal. So we have FT1 is equal to MB times G minus A1. That's my expression for FT1 in relation to A1. Now, if I did the same exact thing for the second scenario, I would see that FT2 is equal to MB G minus A2. And what this shows me is that as A2 gets smaller, the force of tension is going to get greater because MB is going to be multiplied by a greater number, right? We know that this is, let's call the mass one kilogram. And you wouldn't need to do all this work, but if for those that are still confused, here's what I'm talking about. If these were both one kilogram and this was 10, if I had to take this one kilogram to solve for tension and say one times 10 minus 2, that would be 8. So T1 would be equal to 8 newtons. But if this was smaller, and now it became 1 is 10 minus 1, now FT2 is 9 newtons, right? Because I multiplied this 1 kilogram by a larger number by subtracting a smaller number. So as A2 goes down very, very small, F2 has to get bigger and bigger and bigger. If you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Have yourselves a great day.